today's episode, we're talking with Brendan Witcher, Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. Brendan will uncover how leading retailers are driving strategy within their organizations and common pitfalls to avoid when driving your own strategy within your organization. My name is Adam Silverman, your co-host. Welcome to the Fearless Commerce Podcast. This is the Fearless Commerce Podcast, a regular plunge into understanding why commerce leaders do what they do and how they manage to embrace fearlessness in the face of retail. Today, we're talking with Brendan Witcher, VP and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. Welcome, Brendan. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, it's Brendan, great to be thanks, here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. We have a long history, obviously, together, and we'll talk through some of that and, and hear some of your background. But first, I wanted to ask, how did you get involved in e-commerce originally? And maybe tell us a bit about how you ended up where you are today at Forrester. Yeah, so I think really that journey started when I was working in retail um, at a company called Harry and David. Um, and uh, I was actually a, a buyer for that organization, which had nothing to do with e-commerce. I was buying products, um, but I was terrible at that job. And uh, But what I was really good with was numbers. So instead of firing me, they moved me into inventory planning where I had some successes. Um, but then uh, because it was primarily a marketing firm, actually, um, they said, well, our marketing is really driven by numbers. Harry and David is a little bit ahead of other companies in that way. And so they moved me into marketing because we were very much about databases and statistical significance and things of that nature. So uh, we ended up in that world. And by running marketing, that was right around the time that e-commerce started to become synonymous with marketing, right? Like you had the marketing professional. You didn't have the e-com professional quite yet. You had the marketing professional that was somehow transforming into the e-com professional, right? That sort of thing. So I got I got some exposure in that way. But then um, I got recruited to go work at Guitar Center. Uh, as um, part of the strategic planning team. And then eventually I became in charge of the digital uh, uh, strategic planning team. Uh, and uh, so that was that was really how I got involved in it. I was never really actually in charge of e-commerce as a title right. per se, but I was in charge of the, to understand the initiatives that were going to move the needle for the organization from a digital investment perspective. Yeah. And what I loved about that is you got shoulder to shoulder with me and helped actually build those initiatives too. You weren't just doing the strategy and talking about that. You actually were a practitioner and focused on driving revenue and creating um, amazing strategy and experiences. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the uh, experiences that um, I think was really important during that time was that we were evaluating e-commerce platforms. In fact, uh, we were evaluating uh, two different companies. I'm not going to name who they were, but we were evaluating two different companies. And so I had to basically do a total cost of ownership evaluation of an on-premise solution versus a cloud solution. And I really had to get into the weeds on that. I mean, when you when you do a total cost of ownership, if you're going to be comprehensive about that sort of thing, you have to talk to everybody in the organization. So you really do start to understand how what they do impacts the spend and impacts the the uh, strategy for using uh, a digital property, right, and things. But then, of course, things evolved as they tend to and started. Now we have social apps and, uh, you know, we have social media and we have all these different things you could do. And so channels started to grow digitally. And then we started to do more digital in the store environment, right? Mm -hmm. And so there was just this compounding sort of effect of, um, well, since you're the expert in this, maybe you could be the expert in that and maybe you could be expert in that. (laughs) So, you know, the, the, the exposure to digital really grew very organically, um, and and to some degree by pure uh, proximity to the work uh, enabled me to be a part of the teams that were doing a lot of different things in the digital world. Yeah. And you're in terms of proximity, you're obviously talking with many different retailers, many different retail leaders, whether it be commerce or in store, you get to see everything they're working on. You can sort of comprehend the investments and think about where the, the future goes. So what are the future trends that you're seeing in retail yeah. and commerce in general? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is sort of like legalized espionage, I guess, if you think yeah. about it. If <laughs> I wasn't under NDA, I'd probably be in a bunch of problems. But um, Oh, you're among friends. Yeah, yeah. I know I'm among friends, but I'm still under NDA with everyone on the planet. So I can't really share what, what people are actually working on from a perspective of retailer by retailer, yeah, brand by fine. brand. But of course, the, uh, yeah. the, the future, though, from what I see, is, is it's, it's interesting because if you had asked me that question, maybe six or seven years ago, it would have been in using fulfillment as a competitive advantage or a competitive differentiator, probably the right way to put that, um, by utilizing different ways of expanding channel usage, things of that nature. Now, the interesting thing that happened was while everyone was turning their eyes towards fulfillment, 
commerce became a very interesting space, almost on the down low. Like it's almost like in, in a very secretive way, we started to put commerce in things like uh, Tesla charging stations and through our cars and through our, oh. you know, Alexa devices. And now we're starting to be able to do commerce almost anywhere, just like we used to do fulfillment anywhere. It's not just about um, the properties we own even. Um, there's some some work being done right now in something I like, I like to call inline commerce, which is doing performing commerce, enabling commerce really in a channel that naturally should have a commerce element but doesn't. For example, let's say that I'm in, uh, accepting an invite, an evite rather, to a bir kid's birthday party. Well, we always talk about removing friction, but what people forget is that me having to go to another website to buy that birthday present for that party, that's a friction point. Yeah. Right. Or if I'm on uh, with my doctor and doing a virtual meeting with my doctor, my doctor says, oh, your knee's hurting. I want you to get a knee brace going to Walgreens, the store or going to the online channel to get the knee brace is a pain point. Like that's a friction point. Right. But what if I could just do that right there where the doctor, something comes up on the screen, the doctor says, I want you to get this knee brace yeah. specifically. And I hit buy with my mouse and then it slips to my house. Or during that evite acceptance, I can go in right after I accept the evite, I can select the gifts that that, that person's parent, the kid's parents put in right. so I could buy them right there, right? So commerce anywhere is really being transformed, particularly because right place, right product, right time is really being challenged because of the fact that we've digitized everything from dating to doctor's appointments to religious services to yoga classes. Everything can be digitized now. So it's really just a world of opportunity. Anyone who's doing that well in line commerce today? No, I wouldn't say anyone's doing it well. I think people are just discovering some really interesting things that you can do with it. The, probably the more, um, the companies that are sort of leading in that space have been travel hospitality. It's because there's a natural, very obvious connective tissue between, for example, airlines and airports or hotels and airlines um, or rental car, like rental cars or, or, or ride sharing. Like that's an ecosystem where the traveler, it makes sense for the traveler to go through a journey. Right. Yeah. But if I'm buying, uh, let's say I'm taking a gardening seminar or something, right. Learning how to grow something. Um, you know, there's lots that can go along with that from a commerce perspective, but, but it's not, it's not showing me, you know, miracle grow on the billboard at a Red Sox game. Like that's not going to get yeah, me to buy right, right there. <laughs> the right place to show, well, the right place for me to buy miracle grow is during a, a gardening webinar, right? Like or, or seminar or something like that. But counting on the customer to leave what they're doing and go remember to do that later. That's a big trust factor, right? Like saying, oh, we hope the customer walks away and remembers to buy miracle grow. Yeah. Rather than just saying you're at the seminar, just buy it right there. Right. right. And that's what digital is. That's what digital has really enabled, especially because we all have smartphones now, is that you can really just engage with commerce any place, any time. And so now companies are are testing, not not doing it well, but testing what is the right channel for us and what makes sense. Yeah. Speaking of channels, how is the retail store doing? I know Very you, well. Yeah. So tell us more about that. Yeah. And, and despite people's jeering. I'm not an inflappable fanboy of the physical stores. I do think they're important, uh, especially when even after the pandemic, we're back to about 75% of, of US at least retail sales happening in physical environments. Um, that is an interesting thing to measure these days, though, because there is no hard, fast rule with the way that retailers count things like omnichannel sales, buy online, pick up in store, which is a growing way of buying, growing category purchases. Um, and uh, so it's really up to the retailer to decide how to count those. Um, and it's and it's funny because I'll find that retailers who have made big store investments are counting them as store sales, but people who want their stock price to go up <laughs> will count them as e-commerce sales, right? By by pure accounting factors, let's be super clear here, like you should give it to the store because the cost and the inventory and the labor all are happening at the store. So you would tie revenue to the location of the inventory. Um, but some people are taking some liberties with that reporting and saying, no, no, these are e-commerce sales. So, uh, but the store is doing very well. I think one of the things and I should probably add to the word despite itself onto the end of that. Um, I did some work about two years ago where I, I interviewed a, a bunch of industry professionals and we had this interesting idea to say, well, how would we build a store today if we didn't have stores? Like what if we had no legacy? Mm -hmm. what, like what if there weren't such things as store shelves or point of sale systems or cashiers or whatever, right? Like two people are just sitting around a bar and suddenly go, you know what we should do? Let's just put <laughs> stuff into a physical location and have people buy it. 
Like, what would you do if you already had e-commerce and mobile and AI and all these other things that we have currently, how would you build a physical store? And it was amazing to get some of these results because what we found, we uncovered about 42 different ways that the physical store today is not designed to either optimize for retail operations or to create customer experiences in a way that they would have expected it if they were only trained to shop online. So there's so much work to do in that space. Um, and taking the reverse look at it, I think what's interesting is that you, 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 people tend to forget that the physical store was designed for shoppers to shop in just one way. I walk in, I pull something off a shelf, I go to a cash wrap station and I walk out. That's how those are. The, the store is optimized for that way of shopping. So any other way of shopping, it's not optimized for, right? And we forget that. We forget that. We're trying to use a, you know, a, a, an old machine to do new jobs. And it just doesn't work quite the way it should. And so I'm seeing more investments come back into the store. Fortunately, we've, we've dropped that whole retail apocalypse nonsense. Yeah. Um, it, it was always nonsense. But the, the, the thing of it is, is that we, the, the media has let go of that, which is a good thing for the industry. Um, I think you're seeing more and more companies, especially uh, pure play brands like Warwick Parker and others, uh, are starting to realize we have to be a part of the big pond where most people are you know, fishing now, and that is in physical retail, we need to reach that 75% of consumers. I don't know, you, you, can, you can feel free to dismiss this premise, but um, I think one of the storylines that came out of the pandemic was, and this is probably looking more at e-commerce, but mm -hmm. that the, the rich got richer, and uh, meaning the lar large retailers uh, did better. Um, small, some small retailers did better, but not to anything like the larger retailers. And I'm wondering first whether that that lines up with what you have studied. And second, uh, is there a way for those other retailers that aren't, you know, Walmart, Amazon, et cetera, to, to make up some ground or to change what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, what's really interesting is there's a, and I don't, I don't mean to Dr. Phil this moment, but the, the, the reality is, is there's a, there's a number of factors going into that. First, you have to look at the fact that human beings love aggregators. We love aggregators. We love our trip advisors. We love our Yelps. We love our travelocities, right? The people who can bring, I don't want to go to every website to buy something and do something, which yeah. is an interesting thing in a world where people are saying, I'm going to open a direct to consumer website and I carry, you know, potato chips and I'm going to sell <laughs> potato chips directly, right? Um, but we actually do love aggregators, especially in times when we're stressful. This is where the Dr. Phil side kicks in a little okay. bit, right? Which Fair is enough. the idea of saying, I am so stressed about everything else. I don't want to stress about shopping. So I'm going to go, I'm pushing the easy button on this one for now, right? Like that's why you saw so much movement into okay. that. Plus you, I mean, there was, a, there was a time when I think it was something like the target announced that they had 3 million new customers in a quarter, right. like come to their website. And I thought to myself, I can't believe there's 3 million people that have never shopped at exactly. Target in the U.S. Like exactly. that was my thought. My first thought was these people have never shopped at Target. Like it's amazing. Yeah. Me, right. Yeah. But they, it was like, and it was in Q2 or something, some, a throwaway quarter usually. Right. So it just goes to show how much people moved over. But what happened after that fact is the smart retailers, which all of them are, said, now the, now the goal is to turn them into multi-buyers uh -huh. because once you create a habit, the, the one-time buyers are not necessarily loyal to your brand, but when you can start to create a habit with them saying, well, I'll just go to this company to buy everything. So what they did was they put massive amounts of promotion dollars into getting those first-time buyers into becoming okay. multi, multi-time buyers. Um, uh, so the, that, that happened. Now to get to your question on the other side of the equation, that's why it, those are the things of why that happened. Add to the fact that many small stores had to close during the pandemic and really consumers didn't have a choice. Yeah, fair They had enough. to go back. They had to go to the big players because that's who was open right at the time, especially if you had grocery. Like if you carried, oh, let's say, um, I don't know, uh, tennis balls, right? Like you're not going to be open during a pandemic because it was only for companies that were you know, like if you were, uh, what was it called? An essential, essential, yeah. essential business. You could stay open. Other than that, you had to close, which was a little discouraging to right? everyone else. Right? Remember all the lawsuits, GameStop saying we're an essential business. Yeah. <laughs> In my household, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, I got a so lot of your old boy. Very much essential, right? We played a lot of tennis and a lot of video games. Yeah, right. It's particularly a so, pandemic. Yeah. So it, it was, you know, but that was what was going on too. So you combine all of those things and you did shift customers over. But your question wasn't 
all of that. Your question was also um, partly uh, what is a, a smaller retailer to do in this world. Um, and I do think it gets back to the whole idea of there are just some things that big retailers aren't going to do because it, it's it's not to their benefit necessarily to do it, but also because they don't have the mindset to do it. And I do not mean to insult my my brothers and sisters in the retail industry when I say this, but generally large retailers tend to think if we don't have a solution for the whole store or the whole experience, then it's not a solution, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll yeah. say, so example, I remember I was talking to one of these large retailers and they said, which company should we be more like? And I, I mentioned Sephora at the time. I said, you should be like Sephora. And they said, well, they kind of laughed at me and they're like, well, we're nothing like Sephora. And I said, well, that's kind of your problem, first of all. <laughs> right, right. I go, well, but that's my point. <laughs> I go, right, that's kind of my point. But, but then secondly, in addition to that, right, I said, so do you sell makeup? And they said, yes. I go, do you think that people might want to try what, that virtually try that makeup on before they buy it? Like, why is that a pain point for someone walking into Sephora, but not into your store? Right. Right. Sephora didn't do that to, for fun. They did it because they knew people would like to see what makeup looks like before they try it on. But this larger retailer couldn't get their heads wrapped around that because that wasn't a solution for the toy department and the sweater mm -hmm. department. Right. It was just for the makeup department. They weren't thinking about a single customer journey. They were thinking about the whole journey. So if you're a smaller retailer, and I'm making the assumption that you do, are not a multi-category retailer in that right. way, right. Um, you can find new innovative ways mm -hmm. to serve the customer when you understand the pain point the customer is going through in buying your type of specific products. Yeah. No, I think that, that makes a ton of sense. Should we dip our toe into fraud and payments? Oh, I think after you, this is your question. Oh, I, I thought you wanted to dip, dip your toe into uh, the irrational. Somebody, oh, we're gonna, gonna, somebody we're dip gonna, your toe. We're going to dip some toes here. Dip some toes. Uh, yeah. No, um, I, I do have this uh, question I wrote down verbatim. Oh, okay. I think Stand I might by. have it here. You want to... You, you got it? Great. So... This will intrigue you. What, what is the question about fraud and payments that people aren't asking that they should be asking? This, that, the, the reason that's such a good question is because uh, when I talk to companies, like say for example, um, I was working with this fuel company that has about 44,000 locations over in Asia. Okay, so huge company. I mean, they have lots more, but this the, the region I was dealing with was, was APAC. And they have 44,000 locations and they were sharing with me their strategy for, you know, what the, what their, the store of the future, the retail of the future for their business was because they have convenience too, right? That sort of thing. And after looking at their plans, everything that they were doing, I said, you're, everything looks great, but you have an assumption here that I think could cause you some problems. Like, what's that? I go, you're making the assumption 10 years from now, everyone's still paying with credit cards. All these investments rely on credit cards not going away. And this is part of the problem with people who, for example, call themselves futurists. Because a futurist usually takes current situations and says, what will the future look like given today's situations? But we don't know what the future is going to look like in a lot of ways, right? So what if everybody's paying, you know, with biometrics? Or what if everyone's paying with their voice? Or what if everyone's paying through computer vision, recognizing certain things, right, about them? Or what have you, right? Think about all the investments they were going to make that company was going to make in all these terminals and all these things and all of this, the sort of ways of paying, but it all relied on that piece of plastic. Right. And I'm not saying that I even know what the future of payments could right. be. It could be something else. It could be a chip in my arm. Like who knows? Yeah, I'm, yeah. You know, like who knows what's going to come around the corner. The problem is that what I explained to them was if it's not credit cards, like full stop, if it's not credit cards, all this stuff becomes worthless. Right. And I'm not saying what I know what it will what it will be, but I'm saying that's a a constant that needs to stay here for the next ten years for this to make sense. And people don't think that way. No, they generally don't think about you know pr payments and fraud and the investments that are making. They make the investments for today, and they're they're thinking I'm future proofing my business. But I brought up earlier t today in our discussion about the idea of well, if I'm you know if I'm at a Tesla charging station, maybe I want to get a Starbucks. Right. Yeah. I'm, stand, yeah. I'm just standing there for yeah, 15 minutes. Might as well. Maybe I want to order a Starbucks so I can pick it up. But, you know, I want to be able to do that right through the through the machine. Uh -huh. Right. That I'm standing next to or whatever. Right. Maybe have your car tell the right? machine. That sort of thing. Maybe, 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 maybe I have to. Maybe it's it's tied to my 
you know, Starbucks card is tied to my license plate, which right. now when I go through the drive through at Starbucks, it recognizes my license plate and it pays for it on its own. Who knows, right. right? That sort of thing. And that's one of the difficulties in sort of future fitting your technology investments or buying solutions for fraud and payments is making sure that you're working with a company or buying solutions that don't only fit the needs you have today, but don't create such hard lines for you in a way that okay. if things change around you, those things can't flex with the things that are changing around you. And that's that's a big problem a lot of times. I think you answered my next question because as you were explaining that, which is fascinating, I was thinking, you know, couldn't you end up paralyzed? Like, so what do you do? Like, you, you know, you can't do, or wouldn't be wise to do something based entirely on credit cards for the next 10 years, but you wanna do something. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that I talk a lot about in strategy is that strategy work is really, really hard. And part of it that makes it hard is making sure that you're accounting for those variables. And this is this is part of the pre-work, pre-launch, right? You're saying, okay, we can't we can't say for sure A or B is going to happen. But if we launch and it turns out to be A, this is what we'll do. If it turns out to be B, this is what we'll do. Too many companies are like, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Right. Well, that is a terrible yeah, That's idea. a bad time to be crossing the bridge. Because, you, because there might be a time when you say there is no solution for A right. or B. Right. And now the whole project, which we're already baked in, is is a problem. Like we can't execute on it or it's creating a problem for our organization. And it's, to, to be blunt, it is a little bit of going against the American culture of get things done. Right. And, and in fact, I'm not a big fan of the whole fail fast idea. I think I think the idea of failing fast makes people go too fast to execution and don't really think through strategically the way they need to position things in order to make sure that things are successful. At the end of the day, most people should not be judged on whether or not you got initiatives done. It's whether or not you created business outcomes. And the way you create business outcomes is to have successful strategies that are executed really well, but planned for variables that may occur. So in the case of that company that I was working with overseas, what I said was, well, let's design this plan for credit cards will be here 10 years from now. Let's design this plan for credit cards will not be here 10 years from now. Let's design this plan for people will pay with their voice and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and there's some things that you could really duplicate and say, well, voice could be the same as a handprint and could be a, you know, like you don't have to really, it's, it's not about going so finite that you like literally are stuck, but just having things that, 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 you can see happening in the future, right? If you if you create a, for example, a store, um, and, and you it's a pickup only location store, right? Um, and you've designed it so that okay, well, people will be able to get their orders in 15 minutes once they arrive. Well, what if you can't? What if you can't execute that? What if it's 30 minutes? What are you going to do about that? Right. Or, um, you know, our associates will be able to, you know, run the floor and do all this kind of stuff and blah blah blah. And but what if they can't? What, if, what are you going to do about that? What's your B plan? on Not not the initiative, but your B plan on the variables that are going to affect the initiative. This is why strategy work, if it's easy, you're probably not doing good strategy work. It is always going to be hard. That is just the reality of it. And you have to break away from that cultural thinking of, are we moving fast? You know, it's like, don't move fast, move in the right direction. Be smart about your business because most companies, aside from the Walmarts and the Amazons and the companies like that, like that have billions of dollars on their balance sheet, those companies don't have billions to play with, and not even millions to play with. They really can't afford to do that. And so to me, that's something that organizations need to do a better job of is, is planning for those variables ahead of time and just knowing we have a plan for that. If it goes this way, we have a plan well for that. Well said. I mean, just even you know, challenging failing fast is an interesting topic. And perhaps there's a, a spot for that sort of in between the strategy plans, like how you execute, there could be an approach to that. So, sure, well, sure, if you want to change the color of your buy yes, button, exactly. Then, <laughs> go ahead. You know, fine. Fail fast there. I'm fine with that. You know, that big deal. But when you do shift from store or start a yes, membership program right. that signs up millions of people, yeah. don't fail exactly. fast in those areas. Those are two yeah, big strategies. Right. And then pulling back from those things yeah. can become even, you know, anybody who's worked in retail knows it's about as expensive to unduct tape a solution as it is to yeah, put it or together. You're carrying technical debt forever, right? Or you're you're yeah. right like that's who wants yeah, that that's fun. and what what if i told you it, it only took a little bit of extra effort for up front people who thought strategically and and just make sure you have vetted these plans and really say you know even if your your company's like well that's never going to happen fine but what if it right. does like do, do, who's it going to hurt to have a plan in place oh it's going to take an extra week to execute fine 
is that week worth it? Like, because yeah. if this goes south, it's going to cost you millions. Right. And it's just, it's too much of a, a, a thing that people sidestep and they don't take seriously. And that's why, you know, now, you, now you're suffering the consequences of your actions. As an analyst, I get to say this, which is yeah. nice. Yeah. But, but the reality is, is that your organization's probably going to be like, oh, well, that's okay. We're all going to not see that we did right. that. We're yeah, going yeah, yeah. yeah. right. to wash right. it under the rug, right? Because we were all part of yeah, it, right. right? Like shared responsibility means no accountability, yes. right? That yes, sort of idea. Exactly. And so this is, you know, it, sometimes it's not too hard to see why companies are struggling. And it's a lot of times it's in the strategic work that they're not that doing. That makes sense. I mean, it's, it's sort of, sort of, the bullet point advice sort of is, um, you know, sometimes just skip the failing part. Yeah, if you can. And, and sometimes not? don't go yeah. fast. I know that, but. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't, don't fail at all. Why fail at all? I, I don't get that concept. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't, I don't understand that idea. Fail fast. No, don't fail. Like, what if I said, like, there, was if I said there was another way to do it, but not right. fail? Yeah. Learn, learn, learn. Yeah, yeah. right? Learn. You know, plan, plan learn, learn, learn execute, adjust. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, agility. Rather than, rather than the binary sort of like we're going to spend a million dollars rather than five, and we're going to like. See if it works. And if it doesn't work, we're going to kill the whole thing. It's a million dollars yeah. gone. Yeah. Right? Maybe even two because you're unwinding it for another million. Yeah. That sort of thing. Absolutely. So it's like, well, would it have been better to do that or spend a little extra time to say, how does this five million work to do it the right way to make sure that and that five million accounts for any shifts you need to make to the variables that you need to address as you execute, right? But that's where the full boat is. But then you have, what if I told you that was a, the, uh, you know, five or six times X more likelihood that you're going to execute properly. Well, would you do it? To me, that to me is is an argument that companies need to decide for themselves what your culture like. But I, I'm not about getting things done. I'm getting about getting things done. Yeah, right. that makes sense. Okay, let's shift gears. Okay. Any okay. irrational fear? Since this is the Fearless Commerce podcast, what's your one irrational fear besides working with me again? <laughs> well, that's probably a rational <laughs> one. <laughs> that's a very exactly. rational. I didn't say anything. <laughs> Um, any irrational fears, like irrational on yeah. my part or irrational about no, other just parts? Like, we're, let's, we're talking about you. I have nothing to lose, so I don't get much. <laughs> I don't have much fear. Um, may, maybe that chat GPT is going to start writing my papers for me, which actually would be fine because then I could just, I could just do speeches. There we go. All the we won't tell, we'll tell Fiona. Okay, yeah, don't great. Film, tell and so, what is that. what does being fearless mean to you? I know you. I heard your presentation. I, I I loved your perspective. Tell us what being fearless means to you. You know, the, 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 uh, one of the speakers earlier today, um, and I think it was well said, um, although it's been said a few times by other people as well, is the idea that fearlessness is not the lack of fear. It's about doing what you need to do in spite of fear, right? Despite having fears, right? I think Rosa Parks or somebody said that originally. Um, somebody did. Someone, someone in, the, um, in, the, in the black civil rights uh, movement said that um but anyway uh i think that what's really interesting about um being fearless as a as an individual working in industry is being able to be comfortable with challenging very 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 well-known status quo like I, there's a couple of them that i've said even in this podcast so far like the of right place right product right time that is a i mean i learned about that in my marketing classes 30 years ago yeah right? Like that's been around forever. But now what is that? What does that mean? Does it mean the same thing it's always meant? Maybe it doesn't because our places have changed. The places for commerce have changed, right? And so now because the places of commerce, that means what is the right product? What is the right place? What is, you know, like what is the right promotion or whatever it is? So that's the kind of stuff that I think companies need to do. Now, let me give you the, the reason why of that. Because here's what's kind of funny. I go to these conferences and I hear people get on stage and talk about surprising and delighting. They're surprising and delighting customers. We're creating differentiated experiences, blah, blah, blah. I don't know where that's coming from. I like literally have no idea who like thinks that because if I go to pick random, you, you guys could write them down. I could go to seven websites and I guarantee they're going to have a homepage. They'll have a product listing page. They'll have a product description page and they'll have a checkout. What is so darn differentiated about that? Right? Oh, we're personalizing based on age, gender, and zip code. So is everybody else. Oh, but yeah, we're using the data that we bought from another from a list service. Yeah, so is everybody else. So tell me where these differentiated experiences come from. They're not that differentiated. And nobody's really leaving your website going, wow, I'm surprised and delighted by that experience. It's like, no, I bought Q-tips. I'm moving on. I got kids' soccer practice to take, right? Like, that's, that's the reality. And I think a lot of people today in industry 
are kind of drinking their own Kool-Aid. They've said it so much that they almost believe it, which is a little bit scary because it's like you don't differentiate experiences because you're doing what everyone else is doing. In fact, I question how you're even winning customers at all if you're doing what everyone else is doing. Do you even know why customers are, oh, because they love our products and they love our values and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's kind of a bunch of BS too because it's like, you know, we're not, that's not really how we shop for things. Remember, what's really interesting, here's a stat for you. You know, I don't really talk about data too much, but I'm going to throw one at you. Um, is the average American household has 16,000 individual items in it. 16,000. And that's everything from our refrigerator to the toys in our closets Gu- to guitars. bed sheets. Guitars. Uh, guitars. In Adam's case, in Adam's Lots case it's, it's 17,000. He has 1,000 pieces of musical equipment. But, um, the, uh, but even the nails in our wall, the drywall, oh, wow. yeah. everything like that, bird seed, whatever it is you got, right? 16,000 individual items. We probably care about three. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> right. True. The rest of it, if we could just hold our temples and go, and dog food would appear in our house. That's how we shop for dog food: right. to bananas, to batteries, to light bulbs. To most purchases are very commoditized. Yeah. Like we don't care. Each individual customer, some somebody may care about their lipstick, somebody may care about their smartphone, somebody may care about their television or their Xbox or something. But we each have our things. But we don't. We don't care about. 99.9% of the items in our house we really could care less about. We really just want them, right. right? And so I think a lot of retailers, they're like, we want to develop a relationship with the customer. I'm like, customer does not want a relationship with you, right? They want to get their stuff and move on. And I think a lot of companies, they, they tell themselves these sort of stories. And the problem is, you may ask, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is you build your strategies off of those. Right. And if you think we want to build a customer relationship with our customer, that's not being customer obsessed. That's being company obsessed, right? I'm we want that's we we want to do this to the customer. That's not about the customer. It's about you. Yeah, right. And people mess that up all the time. They start forgetting. They get confused between the two. Yeah. And I, and I think a lot of companies who say, say they're customer obsessed, they really don't even know what they're talking about right out of the gate because they confuse those two so badly. So honestly, I think that that. Um, what organizations need to do is they need to rethink and challenge themselves. Getting back to your fearless question, I think, you know, every sentence you say in a day, ask yourself, is that true? And be willing to say, no, it's really not. And then ask yourself, but how much of our strategy is built upon that thing that we believe to be true? And then you start to get really scared. You know, you want to talk about what keeps me up at night? Right. Is that I is that I make a call on something and I'm too lazy to really dig into it and I may give somebody some bad advice. Yeah. That's the thing that keeps me up as an analyst up at night is I know that people are relying on me for good advice. They're relying on me for information to make business decisions. And if I get strategically lazy in my own mind and I don't do the deep dives I need to do and that sort of thing, then I could end up giving people bad advice. And I think a lot of retailers and business professionals need to take that same attitude and say, what's really on the line here? I mean, if you're the kind of person that says, I'm probably not going to worry this company two years from now, then you may say to yourself, I could care less. I could be right. I could be wrong. And I don't care. And I think that that's part of the problem, too, is that people are transitioning so much that they don't care about the long term impact of some of the decisions they're making, Um, not just leadership, but like directors, VPs, even managers in some cases. And I think that's 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 a systemic problem throughout the industry is that we just have people who aren't really feeling like they have so enough skin in the game to put in the work to make a great decision. That is interesting. Yeah. You almost might want to make a splash quickly and move on before, you know, it's the 10 years later and that whole thing was a terrible idea. Really, it's about recognizing when people are doing bad strategy or when they're, when they're doing something that isn't strategic and they think that it is. How do you recognize those triggers? How do you recognize when people are using, you know, uh, confirmation bias? How do you recognize when you're letting something go that chaos theory will destroy um, because you're not being proactive in, in your strategic planning of that initiative. Um, you know, like, how do you recognize those moments? And not that you're in a position necessarily to always be in control of that stuff, but you are in a position to say, how do I work a little bit so that we shift, not change and not be, you know, completely uh, the foil of the project, if you will, but rather, how do I help the organization see a different perspective that may eventually move us in the right direction. And that's the kind of thing you got to just keep an eye out for those types of things, but you don't know them until you recognize them. That's a lot to think about here. Love this. Yeah.